Welcome to Disciple Dojo. This afternoon, I got to sit and have a conversation with my friend, Dr. Drew Johnson. You may remember Drew from our previous episode where we talked about quiet time, and that was certainly um, an interesting discussion, judging by the comments that I and he received from it. And during that episode, he had mentioned an upcoming book that he had that would be released in the following year. Well, lo and behold, his new book, What Hath Darwin to Do with Scripture, is going to be coming out in December. And you can actually read the first chapter of it for free over on IVP Academics website. So I told Drew, well, when that book comes out, you got to come back into the dojo and talk about it because one of the areas that we have spent a good deal of time teaching and discussing and offering courses on here at Disciple Dojo has been the intersection between science and scripture. So I was so glad to have Drew Johnson back here at Disciple Dojo. And to just let you know, before we get to the interview, we're only able to do stuff like this because of viewers, because people subscribe to this channel and like and react and respond and share our videos. So if you haven't already done that, I would really, really appreciate you doing that. That is the biggest way without spending a dime that you can help this ministry continue to grow. Also, be sure to check the video description, like scroll down if you're watching this on YouTube and look at the video description because I'm gonna include links in the video description to some of the other video series we've done here on the channel that deal with some of the issues that Drew and I just had a chance to touch on and not go in great detail about. I'm also gonna include a list of recommended resources. So I'm just mentioning this to make you aware if you're just watching this video and you never think, oh, if I tap on the description, there's notes down there and links to resources. Make sure you do that. And one of those links, which you can tap on, is the link to becoming a monthly dojo donor. Now, you don't have to do this. This is not uh, begging for money and saying God's going to bless you if you sow your seed into this ministry or any of that nonsense. Just letting you know Disciple Dojo is entirely donor funded. We are a nonprofit. We rely on people supporting this ministry who believe in it. So if you appreciate this video, if you enjoy the content that Disciple Dojo puts out and you want to help us keep doing it, we would greatly appreciate you becoming a monthly dojo donor at whatever dollar amount you're able and willing to give. So with that being said, let's once again talk to our friend, Dr. Drew Johnson. I am here with our friend, Dr. Drew Johnson. This is your Disciple Dojo Blue Belt appearance. In mm. Jiu-Jitsu, Blue Belt is the second belt. This is your second time being on here. So you're moving up in the ranks. Uh, you still have, yeah, I nice. think Carmen, Carmen's the record holder. She's yeah. you know, been the most times, but I love seeing can I, can I? How many degrees of black can I work out? That's all I want to know. That's the hard, man. There are 10 degrees of black belts. So. 10 degrees. Yeah. I heard, you tell me if it's true, because I work on Bible Dojo, which is mm -hmm. like a kinship, you know, a brotherly, sisterly yep. friend of your show. Um, um that black belt just basically says, now you're really ready to learn. It's not that, like you've reached the pinnacle, but. That is the exactly what it is. Most people think black belt is expert. And, and if anything, black belt means you're an expert student. It, mm. Like you, you have gone through and now you're, I joke about people when, when I got my black belt, which was in 2018, I didn't feel like I actually was a jujitsu black belt until around 2020, 2021, because you realize how much you don't know. And I think it's like with any discipline with biblical studies, right. you know, you may think yep. you're, you get out of Bible college and you're like, I know the Bible. And then you go to a first like, you know, SBL or some mm -hmm. PhD dissertation and you're just like, oh, I don't know way more. <laughs> I don't know anything. Yeah. yeah. Then you go the opposite way. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So I want okay. to ask well, you about I like that analogy. Let me ask you about Bible Dojo. Um, I want to hear what's going on with it. How can people find it? Give, give a plug for that, because I do want Disciple Dojo viewers to also be Bible Dojo viewers. So what yeah, do people need? So to know? it's basically like Bible interpretation meets Duolingo or Bible project level content meets Duolingo format. And so you walk people through trainings where again you start with a white belt and you work your way up the black although we don't have any black belt lessons yet we're i think we're up to green belt or something like that i'm not sure how the belts work but it's that idea that you and the reason why bible dojo and i think disciple jo dojo too it's the, the metaphor works really well is 
you come here to wrestle, right? You're not coming here just to click and tap through, but you actually right. have to stop and think. And that's been one of the problems in user testing is people want to just kind of tap through and going, yeah, 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 I get it. Mm-hmm. And and then they get a little farther into the exercise and realize, oh, wait, I, I missed something. I didn't actually fully understand what happened here. So to get people to slow down, read, wrestle, think, um, and in the same way that, you know, if you did high school Spanish, I'm sure you can get pretty far in the first couple of lessons of Duolingo or Babel Spanish or one of those or Rosetta Stone. Um, but but that prior experience runs out pretty quickly and, and you're in the thick of it pretty quick. So it's real fun to watch people, you know, in real time, learn skills of interpretation. And I think the best thing about it is it's it's it focuses on good skills and it kind of it neglects all the bads. It basically says, look, people b- bring all kinds of baggage to the Bible. Mm-hmm. It just throws that to the side and says, let's just focus on what works and what will make you a better Bible interpreter. Um, or maybe even we're focusing on helping you not to make basic mistakes mm-hmm. and not to ask the wrong questions, but to ask better questions. So it's really nuts and bolts. Um, and and when people user test it, they're like, wow, okay, I both learned like that part of scripture, usually a part of scripture they didn't even know existed because I did the biblical law one. Um, mm-hmm. And then they um, and then they also get real skills. Uh, right now, there is a an alpha version of it. So the beta isn't out yet, but the alpha version of it is at uh, enterthebibledojo.com. And you can go on there and you have to get registered. I mean, you just get registered so it can track your progress so you don't have to redo um, trainings. Right. Uh, and you can try out the biblical law ones right now. And ritual and poetry are right behind it. They're they're going to be done this year sometime. So that's awesome. It's very much so. What you're doing is the the difference between Bible Dojo and Disciple Dojo. Disciple Dojo is sort of a catch all of like just whatever I think is cool and want to talk about. Right. Bible Dojo really is a structured like it's like entering into an actual dojo and training and learning. And so for viewers that are watching check out the preliminary what they're doing and get in on the ground floor you're getting a structure and you're getting tools like drew said how to interpret the different genres or how to do hermeneutics how to do this stuff that you know people learn maybe in a bible class or seminary classroom but doesn't always trickle out to the everyday listeners I think it's great. I love it. Uh, and, and it's fun. It has a very yeah. fun feel to it. The characters, uh, these the, the little like animal type characters, right? Yeah. Are they- we actually have a comedy writer for it. So nice. there, there's somebody who is actually in charge of like just putting comedic elements to get. Yeah, there are different characters and you have co-learners who are long, learning alongside of you. And yeah. some of them are. One of them is dumb and always put, pitches out stupid answers <laughs> so they can be batted down. Or I shouldn't say stupid, but you know, maybe the answer everybody's thinking, but it's clearly not right. Um, right, right. So, so yeah, and, and everything is just, you know, that that group, Kevin Kim and Sang, uh, these are extremely sharp people. They've developed mm-hmm. a lot of software. They just won a hackathon. I just found out they won a hundred thousand dollars in a hackathon. Yeah. Like they're they're both really good at what they do on the technical side, and they're really good on Clearly. thinking about how to help Christians um, mm-hmm. be better readers of Scripture. It's it's very witty. It's and it's and, and again, but it's not uh, it's not a, a gimmick. The content is actually no. solid biblical scholarship. So it very much it's like a it's a it's a much better done version of kind of like our superhero seminary videos. Um, you're not just literally taking a picture with your phone of action figures on a shelf, but um, <laughs> it's it's well done. So people definitely go check it out. I'll put a link in the video description below. And I, I really do. I want to see more Disciple Dojo viewers showing love to Bible Dojo as they're getting started because you're on the ground floor. This is yes. it reminds me of way back back when I first heard about the Bible project, when they were in their crowdsourcing days and they had a couple of videos out. And, uh, I think Carmen sent me a video. She's like, I've been using this with my kids to teach them the old Testament. And I watched it and was like, this is amazing. And so we started becoming disciple. Dojo was like on the back when they were crowdsourcing, you know, a few bucks a month or whatever. And, and it's just, you know, Bible projects blown up and become this thing. So I could, I could see that similar thing happening with, uh, Bible Dojo as people jump on board and are like, oh, this is this is really helpful and it's clever and it's well done. Yeah. So and it's I think it's passive. Awesome. Uh, I mean, I, I love Bible Project Video. I use all their stuff in my classes. Um, 
But the the one downside, and I've talked to John and Tim about this, and they said, you know, the the, pro- the problem is it's all passive. You're sitting there. It relies on you really doing all of the work. Right. Um, so this is in no way trying to, you know, jockey for a marketplace or anything like that. It's just basically saying, hey, here's another tool in, in the toolbox. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it may hit, it may strike a different, like the people who aren't maybe as motivated self-learners, they need a little guidance. They need a little yeah. prodding or some interaction. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's perfect for that. So By all I, means, yeah. Well, let us talk about what you have coming out. You got a new book. You mentioned it the first time you were on the show back when we had you on, and you talked about this title that you were, you know, kicking around. And now I just read the first chapter this morning on the internet. I uh, is it who's the publisher? Is it the IVP yeah. Academic? I didn't Even want to speak. Yeah, it's not on the super academic, as you can tell by reading the intro. It's not. Hard hitting yes. academic, yeah. Yes, it's popular level. So anybody, any interested Bible readers, uh, right. any interested science, history, any interested reader could easily read it. At least the first chapter. Now, if you <laughs> take a turn in the next chapters and get really deep, I, I, well, it's it's a book that's it's aimed at scientists, uh, theologians, Bible people. So you have to kind of speak in the middle there. You still have mm-hmm. to write to like in eighth grade level when you're trying to speak to all of those technical people. Right. Because you have people in so widely different fields right. and they can easily with their own jargons talk past each other. Exactly. And so you kind of meet down in the middle. It's very engaging. I read the first chapter, very engaging. Uh, this is a topic and an issue that Disciple Dojo, we've dealt with a good bit over the years. Mm-hmm. We have a course here, Bible and Science, Friends or Foes, where we just sort of try to tease through all of the issues that people bring to the table. But your book, What Hath Darwin to Do with Scripture? And that's a strange title at first for two reasons. I want to get your thoughts on both of these reasons. Number one, because those, obviously, it's controversial that most people would say nothing In fact, they would say those things are antithetical. And so I'll ask you about that in a second. But firstly, for the theology nerds, they Mm. know that that is an oblique reference to Tertullian, I believe. And he asked famously, was it what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem or Jerusalem or, 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 or Jerusalem to Athens? I can never remember which one's first. Yeah, it's a Tertullian. It's a quote by Tertullian. And the whole point, I believe, and I'm not a church history buff at all, but I believe his whole point in asking that rhetorical question was to say, we don't need philosophy or, Mm -hmm. or secular pagan in his day, pagan learning. We just need scripture. And that's what we have. So why did you, or IVP academic, whoever ended up choosing the topic. But why, why that topic for this book? Um, interestingly, or t- interesting to me, I spoke, I gave a paper at one of the Colossian Forum biologos things. Um, geez, I don't know, a long time ago, uh, maybe 2014, 15. And, um, and the issue just kind of, it, I, you know, I was trying to think about the issue of uh, how people try to like set aside Genesis one through 11 and kind of and replace it with an evolutionary uh, origin story. And that never sat right with me and I could never figure out why. And I, I wrote a paper, it was not a good paper. And um, the people in the room were really helpful in pointing out to me why it wasn't, it was trying to do too much in, in one paper, you, you know, those kind of papers. And, um, but what I was trying to show is if you try to disentangle this and, and say here, you know, I just want to insert the evolutionary storyline of hominids, at least, uh, into that, the biblical storyline, why it's actually more entangled and that doesn't work, right? You're going to have to find another way to Mm -hmm. make this work out if that's the goal. Uh, And then I just brewed on that for a long time. And then the Henry Center was doing this creation project, um, Templeton project over three or six years. It was quite a while. And um, and then they asked me if I considered, I talked to one of them about it and they said, hey, would you consider doing like sabbatical and, and doing a research leave? And so I got research leave went and went uh, to them just with this question, like, uh, and, and as I talked through it with them, I just said, it, it just bothers me that people very quickly set aside Genesis 1 through 11 as kind of an apples to orange like storyline. They're not talking about science. They don't understand science, which I think actually that's, I have some, I have some very cold takes on that issue. Um, But what, 
what dawned on me slowly, the more I mold over this, I'm like, wait, okay, Darwin, I read Darwin in college, but I hadn't really read him since then. And like, okay, the issues of natural selection, just taking natural selection as a subset of evolutionary thought and process and those things. Hmm. It's, you know, uh, scarcity of resource uh, begets violent competition, which um, which varies also with climate on uh, a creature's fit to their own habitat. And the goal is to sexually propagate your genetic line as widely as possible. And the more I thought, I was like, wait, that's that's exactly what Genesis 1 through 11 is about. And I mean, and, and you know, the Hebrew, so you can appreciate the deeper ways in which the word play and uh, the, the the dependence of the dirt lean on the dirt and, uh, and the, the dirt being a moral agent and the idea that scarcity, I mean, the, the curse is... A, you know, the the major, the fall, as we call it, is not a massacre of innocent children. It's somebody eating the wrong thing, you know, doing, you know, taking matters in their own hand, whatever you think is going on there. Uh, and then the curse is a, a disorientation of the fertility of the of the humans uh, and, and uh, a disorientation of the fertility of the ground with reference to the humans specifically. Mm. And that storyline just gets worked out all the way through. And then they are exiled. They don't fit the habitat, you know, habitat they once fit, they no longer fit because of their uh, their behavior. Uh, and so, like, I just kept on thinking, the biblical authors actually want to talk about what we call natural selection. They just have a slightly different way of talking about it. Um, and But they have very thick ideas that they're working out. And so wouldn't it be great if we just put these in side by side conversation and said, OK, here's what Darwin says about uh, sexual propagation. Here's what evolutionary science has kind of come around to over the century and a half. Um, and here's where the biblical authors are with it. And so that's what I kind of do with each topic. Just walk through each area of natural selection and kind of give those three perspectives. Darwin kind of because ev evolutionary science is sometimes they think Darwin's wrong about things now, or they think he needs to be modified in some way. And then put the biblical authors in conversation and then just see where the areas of tension are. And so there's strange overlap and in, in, in new and more profound conflict, I think, that I've discovered by doing that. It's, it's not a book that is trying to harmonize the views, at least from what I could tell, yeah, to say, not at all. Yeah. This is how we make them fit together. And it's also, yeah. at least the first chapter and what I've heard you talk about it of, it's not a book that's trying to like win the debate. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of it is you think that there's just people are already off on the wrong foot in the debate itself most of the time. It, yeah. it, the first chapter, let for, me read for it. Christians in the debate, I should say. Yeah. Right. You, yeah. um, you said on, I think this is around uh, page four or five, you said, ironically, a devout Christian driving that Jesus fish car, a vehicle that resulted from centuries of applied science, poo-poos, quote, those scientists for promoting an anti-Christian agenda. And this is kind of, you know, the Darwin, the Christian fish eating the Darwin fish, yeah. as opposed to the Darwin fish that is a mock of the Christian fish, but it has legs on it. So it's like battle of the cheesy uh, bumper stickers right. or or bumper car it's magnets. An actual culture war. <laughs> it is, and it's enacted, <laughs> waged on the bumpers of cars across yes. America. So you you say on one side you've got these, you know, the devout Christian who is just immediately ready to dismiss those godless scientists, right. and then you said elsewhere in the world, a theoretical physicist naively dismisses religion as blind faith in invisible spirits. So you have the other side. Of And you, I see this more since my college days as the Internet has sort of popularized science and yes. streaming television and YouTube and all of these things. You have more thoughtful. We're not talking like the Richard Dawkins or sort of the angry atheists, but you have more right. of like the Neil deGrasse Tysons and the other popularizers, Brian Cox and others who are just – not necessarily antagonistic, but mm -hmm. they just completely dis as if thousands of years of philosophy and uh, you know metaphysics and all of this stuff ha just doesn't exist. Right, it's not worth as if thousands of years about. of uh, uh, or as if the scientific enterprise itself doesn't rest entirely on faith in, in a system that cannot be proven. Right, and and I don't mean that in some kind of like apologetics you know, winky way. I, right. I, I really mean that like that I, I do, I teach entire semester long courses on this topic. When you get into the logic and the meta logic and the, uh, the philosophy of science and the philosophy of, uh, what proof would look like, um, mm -hmm. 
and if it's possible, there really is a mythology of science that scientists themselves often believe. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and once you explain to them that that's probably not going on in science, that science actually looks, you know, if anthropologists when anthropologists study science scientists in labs, the their their um, summary is basically this looks like a mystery religion, <laughs> uh, like they're not they're not entirely wrong, right? And mm -hmm. so so there is a sense where there's a lack you're right i think the kind of um the splitting of the american mind in these different cultural wars mm -hmm. there is it's just a bunch of caricatures and so this is right. trying to blow past some of those caricatures and say like let's just hear what these different conceptual worlds are saying how they conceptualize the nature of reality the kind of goals of nature mm -hmm. itself what does nature even mean uh, to each one of them which is slightly different um and then I think the joy of it is that the, there is like, I, I hate to use the term, but a metaphysical view in scripture that gets ignored by a lot of Christians. And so I get to delightfully interject that back in, uh, mm -hmm. which um, which me and Richard Middleton have had, had discussions about that that question of like, what is their metaphysical view? And he doesn't like the word metaphysical view for reasons I, I deeply respect. But mm -hmm. there's some view that the biblical authors have that is never taken to an account in this discussion, I should say, is rarely taken into account. That is, um, that actually kind of changes a lot of how this conversation can go. And so how would you give a, a, a elevator pitch of that view, like a thumbnail sketch uh, I don't think I do it in that intro chapter, but the next chapter, I, I use the Gloria Patri as it was in the beginning, is now, ever more shall be. Mm -hmm. uh, that That is actually the the Gloria uh, sci Scientia, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that that's kind of the working physical, metaphysical assumption of all science is that the world has always been this way. It is this way now, and it will continue to be this way. And I mean, like mm -hmm. laws of thermodynamics, but even something slightly more different than that. Um and the biblical authors just don't seem to believe that at all. They they believe the world was once one way, is now a different way, and will eventually be restored, righted, or reoriented towards a new way. Mm -hmm. Um so that and and so in that sense, the biblical authors, I think, if you you know, pulled at least the ones that want to have these conversations, if you pulled them into the present day reality, explain to what then what Darwin is seeing mm -hmm. and observing and um and what he's assuming. I think they go like, yeah, I, I understand that from uh, if if I only knew of this present state of the cosmos, that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually believe the cosmos used to be in a different metaphysical orientation is now in this corrupted, twisted, fractured, uh, you know, uh, what's that word for it? In, in tropic, entro the this cosmos of entropy mm -hmm. um, and that it ultimately is going to be reoriented metaphysically towards, you know, flourishing and benefic beneficence. Which the final chapter is where I have to imagine what does that look like, and then also look for physical signs of what that like. If that's true, then the physical structure of reality should indicate that that actually could be true. That the, that the physical cosmos could be reoriented towards this good state. And for that, I use life extension technology and psychedelics <laughs> as examples. <laughs> which the which the publisher was like. On the uh, on the book proposal, they're like, "Can you just quickly explain what you're going to say about psychedelics?" <laughs> <laughs> you said, "I I can when Joe Rogan has me on this podcast." <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and you know, like, there's a whole two chapters about sex, and mm. obviously, wow. you know, we'll get to that later. But there's a, a, those are really depressing chapters to write, and um, because there's a lot of not cool things going on with sex in the history of evolutionary. Uh, biology yeah. and in, in the history of humans right um mm -hmm. so uh yeah I, we're having to address some pretty heavy pretty heavy stuff you had a quote and i loved it when i read it because it it's it's the t subtitle of one of the sections in mm. our bible for the rest of us course i literally this is i've been teaching this course 15 years and one of the sections was called what about the dinosaurs? And that's literally a line from, I read that in chapter one. I was like, yes, this is exactly, it's the perfect way to encapsulate you. I'll, I'll read the quote. It's on page five. You, um, you talk about being, uh, I think a 12 year old kid and a youth pastor. Mm -hmm. And you said, raise your hand and say, what about the dinosaurs? I was not going to let this youth pastor say another word until he explained to me where the dinosaurs are in the Bible. And 
I chose that as the title of the section in Bible for the rest of us so long ago, because it is the question every kid has, Mm -hmm. because if there's one thing that's true across the board, it's that kids love dinosaurs. You cannot find a kid that does not. Weirdly. Dinosaurs are cool. They have their favorite dinosaur. Yeah. Girls, boys, doesn't matter. Kids love dinosaurs. (laughs) And so the Bible we read it, and of course we want to ask that question because it's like asking about what does the Bible say about mommy and daddy? What does the Bible say mm-hmm. about you know anything else that we think is great in our world? And it's such a stickler because obviously Christians try to answer that question and yeah. shoehorn stuff into Scripture that Scripture never even remotely touches on. Yeah. In many different ways, everything from oh, the yeah. Ark encounter and, you know, Adam and Eve riding around on velociraptors and Ken Ham approach to the sort of more the, the, um, the concordist where, well, the day, day six, day five is right. where dinosaurs would have fallen. And that is right. expands the different, you know, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, all of those. And I always, you know, I just look at that and go, well cool, but scripture doesn't say any of that. So what, why, when somebody asks you, when you get a hand raised, because you've done ministerial pastoral work and teaching Mm -hmm. and you teach college students, and that is a question that never gets answered as kids. What about Mm -hmm. the dinosaurs? How do you answer that? How do you start to answer that question in a way that leads the discussion in a fruitful path rather than to one of these other dead ends? Um. Well, I mean, first of all, it's it's a very legitimate question. Um, I mean, it's it's not. Uh, I mean, I I make fun of myself and that it was kind of the wrong question ultimately it, to be hung up on, but in right. some ways it was the right question. Um, second, I mean, with college students, I say uh, same thing with like uh, Adam's wife or sorry, uh, um, Kane's wife. Kane's wife. Thank you. Yeah. When's Kane's wife? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Walter Moberly in his uh, Cambridge Theological Commentary on Genesis has a little line that I think is really prescient. It says the biblical authors uh, write in such a way, and I'm not I'm not quoting this, but he says something like this: write in such a way to show you that they're aware of a topic, but they don't want to talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so it's not like they're avoiding the issue of like the whoever put together Genesis 1 through 11 clearly knows that um, a woman comes out of nowhere and marries Cain. Like that's like, right. they don't try to explain where she came from at all. Um, when Cain says, uh, you know, I'll be, if I, if I'm exiled, people will find me and kill me. Right. Mm-hmm. Like they're just tipping their hands saying, yep, other people at some point arose on the earth. That, um, but they are not interested in pursuing that at all. I don't think Genesis 1, is interested in discussing which animals came in which periods in which order. Mm -hmm. Um, It really, uh, I mean, even in Genesis 2, you have animals being made in some kind of particular order and shown to the man or whatever. Um, The most, and this is why I think taking the Bible to be an intellectual tradition is really important um, because you get two chapters on the, the, on creation of the universe and creation of everything within it. And you get 12 chapters on Joseph, who isn't even a, you know, a patriarch that we're going to follow his progeny throughout the rest of the Bible, right? They, right. All of his progeny gets killed off and by 2 Kings 16. So uh, so that what uh, Robert Alter calls the famously laconic nature of the biblical history, mm-hmm. we're just confronting it right there and say, okay, they don't want to talk about, but what do they want to talk about? Um, mm-hmm. They absolutely want to talk about that habitats are created first and then animals are created for those habitats and those mm-hmm. animals fit those habitats uh, appropriately. And again, so that fit to environment, they want to actually talk more about issues of natural selection than they want to talk about the actual biological history of particular animals or um, fish or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I joke around this friend of mine used to tell this funny story of how prayer circles and churches can be gossip rings, you know, and like no. the lady show. Yeah. No. yeah. I've heard. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but the ladies can show up for prayer. And it's like, Oh, we need to pray for Jan. Why? What happened? Yeah. Oh, she just got arrested for stealing, stealing. <laughs> what did she steal? Um, she stole a box of Tic Tacs from the, the get and go. It's like Tic Tacs. What flavor? 
<laughs> irrelevant, right? That's like it doesn't matter. It's and I and so I do think there is some point when we're reading scripture, we do have to like look for that thick, bold line where we're like, okay, this is a question I have, but the narrator is just not interested in answering the question. I would say the same thing about the Akedah in Genesis 22. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the question we all ask when we read that is what kind of a God would ask, you know, a man to kill his son, his only son whom he loves, right? Mm-hmm. That story is completely uninterested in answering that question. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, I think they believe, the author there believes that over the course of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you will get an answer to the question of what kind of a God that is. Right. And I'd say Christians, we get kind of a cheat because that language of your son, your only son whom you love, right, pops up again. And it's like, oh, this God is willing to do this with his only son, right? Mm-hmm. I That methodologically, like reading scripture, I think it's really important for us to keep a uh, have a disciplined read. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, and then say, okay, and then I, I think it's fine to speculate, like, where would dinosaurs fit into the biblical's, the the biblical imagination of mm-hmm. history? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I think I say towards the end of this book, uh, I think if you were to bring the biblical authors into the present, explain to them what we think the universe is like, because they seem to think it's a triple decker, you know, the deeps, Sheol, the grave, the earth, and then the the hard dome, sky, water, whatever. Mm. Um, I don't think it's irrational or an unscientific view. It's just the one that makes sense to people who are living on the earth then. If you were to bring them into the present circumstance and explain to them what we now think, I think they would go like, okay, cool. Like, uh, yeah, now let me now let me integrate what I think is going on there. Um, there that's a good point. Do you tease out the difference or do you even acknowledge the difference? Uh, I know Richard Middleton does our mutual friend, the difference between a, a worldview and a world picture. Um, you know, how you see the world metaphysically versus how you conceive of the world physically. Uh, or do you think that even that distinction just is a foreign one to the biblical authors? Uh, I think it works. I I I think we're all, and I think I, I assume Richard and I would feel very similarly on this. But that all of our thought is analogical. That um, we don't get access to any kind of pure deductive rationality. That that's kind of a fiction of logic and a fiction of thought. And so we're all kind of filling in the dark side of the moon, uh, mm-hmm. as my friend Esther Meek likes to say. Um, we're all projecting you know, and, and thinking about what things might be, um, into the past and, and, and into the future. Um, and so I think there's no world in which we're not constantly thinking about the metaphysical forces that kind of hold things together or cause things to happen. And science is not, you know, this is important because we have lots of caricatures and, and, and mythologies of science, including scientists themselves have caricatures that I don't think are quite correct. Right. Um, but I often have to tell my scientist friends, like, you don't study the visible world. Um, anybody can look at spreadsheets of data. Anybody can look at a telescope image. Anybody can look at a slide at the bottom of a uh, of a microscope and see the same thing. What you do is you try to interpret the invisible features that cause the visible world to be the way it is, right? Mm. And so um, I don't know if that's a worldview or a world picture, Um but we all have both analogical reasoning and maps and models, as Mary Hess argues, for uh, how we think the world is structured. Right. So when we're seeing, we're never just seeing raw data. We're actually, you know, they say all all data are theory laden. Mm-hmm. Uh, the theories are already informing our vision of what we think is impossible. So, yeah, I think the biblical authors, you could just, you know, they had a perfectly reasonable vision of the world, just like I did when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I had certain visions of how the world was working structure. And as I learned more, I had to like start supplanting those or, or backfilling them in some way. Right. And, um, and we all do that. And, you know, like when I was growing up, nobody thought of super string theory. Um, and then for a long time in the nineties and early two thousands, everybody's like super string theory is going to, you know, solve everything. And now everybody's like, eh, super string theory, who knows. Right. Right. Um, so those things will come and go, and mm. as they should, as reality kind of tests them out and bears them out. So that's what I had earlier this year. I, I was um, hired to write an article for Lagos uh, on the rakia in Genesis and, mm. and how we should translate rakia and you know dome, vault, expanse, right. and and sort of look at the way the two 
schools of interpreting it kind of fall into. So I had to do a little bit of a deep dive on ancient views of the mm -hmm. cosmos and that three or four tiered view, depending on which ancient person you're talking to. And, right. and then right. today, how that is a view, even among modern indigenous peoples, that's, mm -hmm. you know, very similar, the sky being a solid dome. And right. so I, my mind for a couple of months was in that uh, kind of swimming around those waters of what, to what degree is scripture trying to say, no, this is factually what you'll find if you go up in space right. versus scripture saying, given this picture of the universe, this is how we're describing God yeah. and, and the important things that you need to know, the world view, the who and the why versus the world picture, which may change over time because it's just it's just a way of describing phenomenologically or theologically what we see. Yeah. And there's not Even that factual like view. Sorry. No, go ahead. That kind of what the way it actually is. I mean, that has a very colloquial history as well. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. there's only, you have to live in a certain time to think that that's actually a thing. And now I don't think most people think there is a way that the world actually is that we have access to and some kind of view from nowhere. Um, but it, it certainly is kind of a, it, it's a way of thinking about the world that is good enough for a good enough. And then, and now we just say like, actually, it's not going to help us to say the way the world actually is. Uh, I mean, again, all the models, the, the models all change and I'm less, I'm less impressed with the idea that we have more accurate models and more impressed with the idea that we have usable models to us within our own frameworks. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm a little wary of the idea that, I mean, if you just study the history of science, um, you're, you're not getting a series of, you're not getting a, a ton of progress um, until you get to the, you know, maybe the 1800s and then math finally frees itself from Greek theology um, and kind of explodes and engineering explodes with it. But again, that wasn't really sciences. That was what you could build based on what you could calculate uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, how, how you could measure things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I get a, I get really worried when people try to poop on ancient cosmologies. I mean, there are ones that I think are very they're inaccurate even in their own day. They're they're projecting entire worlds and ideas that don't seem sustainable. They're not even what would you call them? They're not testable mm -hmm. um, in a real way. Okay, sorry, you, you got me no. on philosophy of science. I, I, well, that's <laughs> why I have you on. That's what you're. Yeah. I mean, you're at the end of the day. That's what your book is getting into, at least yeah. with, with one foot, uh, and then biblical uh, biblical theology with the other. So it seems, at least from reading chapter one, yeah, and no, there's I, a lot I think of biblical theology. <laughs> it, well, and this is these are the so I think these kind of discussions need to happen more across the board because the conversation is dominated by nonsense and i'll say yeah. it because i don't have yeah. any like i don't i can say it because i'm just kind of doing my own thing here nobody's going to cancel you right i mean if i don't if i lose subscribers uh oh well right. maybe that actually be good for the channel generate some controversy <laughs> but but what i mean by that is nonsense in the sense of you have christians building entire ministries around a specific way you have to read genesis in its most right. literal way and not only saying this is what we think the text is saying, but then having the audacity to say, and anyone who doesn't think that the text is right. saying this is 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 forfeiting the gospel, compromising the gospel is, I mean, and I just look at that and go, how obtuse and clueless do you have to, how prideful do you have to be right. in your own interpretive abilities to make such a ridiculous ridiculous claim. I mean, it's it's not a secret. I'm talking about Ken Ham and Answers in right. Genesis. And there are godly people who love that ministry. I get it. I understand. I think, yeah, any kid going to a big ARC exhibit is going to be like, wow, that's amazing. And they may give lip service to some cool science stuff that they like to point out. But just the divisive rigidness of saying, you have to read Genesis this way. Right. And if you don't, you are compromising the entirety of the Christian faith. To me, I look at that and think that's that's just insane. That's just an insane view to take. The levels of pride that have to be involved in that. This isn't a Bashkinham or Answers in Genesis episode. I just cards on the table. I don't yeah. have much respect for that approach because of its divisiveness and its 
uncharitability. But I also know that the up other side sometimes, because I was part of a group on Facebook, I got kicked out of a group on Facebook uh, that was against Answers in Genesis. It was a group for people who were opposed to Answers in Genesis. And I got kicked out because I had the audacity to question some of the theistic evolutionary uh, right. dogma and dogmatic, you know, that they were like, you have to, if you believe anything other than this, you're an right. ignorant fundamentalist. Right. And I got kicked out of that group as well. I I don't think you're trying to, I think you're trying to get people away from both of those um, yes. mindsets because they're just both. There are, there are better challenges. <laughs> <laughs> there are better things to think through than uh, the dogma. Yeah, I think is is the short of the long of that. Um, and and also, I just want you know, part of this is a side project for me. You know, I'm I'm not a scientist, um, although I know many scientists, which I always say is always me trying to sound like I'm not racist. I have lots of scientists, right? Friends. I, I really so. do. Yeah, I have lots of scientists, um, <laughs> and I'm working on a Templeton project on science and and religion. So, like, I, I'm very interested in this intersection. But at the end of the day, this side product, what was a side project has now become a little bit more than that at this point, mm. was really to get Christians to take seriously the conceptual world of Scripture and the intellectual world of Scripture, that they actually are having robust conversations about things that most of us, I mean, if, as I kind of pitched this, I said, look, I think the biblical authors have a very unique and viable view of natural selection. Um, and most people are... Most people at that point have to say, say more. Like, uh, I, I never got a single person who was like, oh, yeah, no, I've been thinking that for years, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and then once you say more, the, the the reception I've gotten so far from reviewers, pre-reviewer, you know, people who like scrub the manuscripts and stuff like that, mm -hmm. were like, yeah, okay, this I didn't think of it this way. But now that you pointed it out, I can't mm -hmm. not see it this way. Um, mm -hmm. So I think what that tells me is that there was some kind of block, some kind of occlusion that prevented people from taking seriously um, these kind of pre pre scientific views on uh, what I just call with natural selection, where the biblical authors have a different view of what natural means um, mm -hmm. or unnatural. And uh, so, and that's in the next second chapter, it talks about all these different views on what people, what do people mean when they say natural or unnatural and what do, the biblical authors probably, even though they don't have a term called natural, what what might they think natural means? Um, mm. So I'm just trying to like elevate. I have a very high view of scripture, mm. like almost too high uh, that like really conservative fundamentalist people can't handle because I'm like, no, I think it's saying a lot more than you're giving it credit for. And it can have a full conversation here mm. and reducing it down to just. Well, it just it just tells you the history of creation right there in those first two chapters uh, is actually doing a disservice to the to what the text is doing, not just what it's saying. Yeah, literarily, it it yeah. shows. I would I do agree that a, a wooden literalism shows a lower view of scripture unintentionally. Yes, um, yep. unintentionally because yes. it doesn't take into account that God could describe creation to whatever degree you think literally it matches. If somebody had right. a video camera there. But he could do it in a way that is of the utmost highest literary artistry and that exactly. is intentionally doing more than just giving the facts. Yeah. And I think that's undeniable. We did a series here uh, last summer on Genesis 1 and a series of videos. I'll link it in the show notes for people that want to do a deep dive where we go through the days of Genesis 1. And mm. and it's you. I don't think I don't see how you can come away from that chapter without seeing this is more than anything else this is a work of literary genius right uh, yeah and, and, and to a point which i'm sure you talked about in there that i always make the point with my students forget about reading this as a modern person just read it as an ancient hebrew who who hebrew is your first language in the iron age this would be very a little bit confusing and disrupting you know as you know it says let there be light and you don't have a source of light until the the fourth day but even more so you have evening and morning, but there's no 24 hour period that's even discernible onto the fourth day. Right. So there's mm -hmm. things that are already are, are playful and skillful and they're doing things that I think deserve our attention, but they're all things that signal to an, even an ancient reader, hang on, we're doing something different here. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. So I, I throw Genesis one in the actual, the genre of uh, genealogy lineage, uh, cause I think that's what it reads mostly like, um, mm. 
which I don't remember if I make an argument for that in this book. I make that for an argument in another book, but right. Um, yes, I think it's brilliantly written. Genesis one through eleven. Most people don't understand how skillfully crafted all of that story is, and I know you do. Uh, all the the literary artistry that's going mm -hmm. on there, which are all like indicators that they're doing something more sophisticated than it initially appears. And the same thing with the God. I did my doctoral dissertation on the Pentateuch and the Gospel of Mark, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to lie to you. I chose Mark to start with in the Gospels because it was the shortest. Um, <laughs> And only once did I get it. I remember reading, maybe it was Morna Hooker or somebody, a Mark scholar who said, Mark is an interwoven tapestry. And I was like, that's a weird phrase to describe a very terse gospel that just says, and then they immediately did this and immediately right. did that. <laughs> and then when I got it in there for long enough, I realized, oh my goodness, this is very terse, but it is not in any way. It's, you know, in some ways I'd say it's the most sophisticated of the gospels because it does so much in so and much less space um uh literarily. And it's just doing very, very sophisticated things. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, to also make the and I think this is what Genesis one through eleven does brilliantly, is um it's scalably comprehensible. So Ooh, it's what do you mean by that? Anybody who hears it can kind of follow like, okay, there's a God who's making things. He's making, you know, forming and filling. You can kind of like a, a child can follow this. Right? Okay. Yeah. So I thought you might want to make sure. Yeah. That's but every, totally every weird. step, the more you understand it, it just gets more like you just see the genius more and more. I think that's why we, it's kind of like, it's a little bit fractal in it's uh, level of sophistication. The more you drill down, you see there's just more there, but I guess not repeating infinitely. So kind of fractal, but, but <laughs> fractal not really. Yeah, fractal that's a, that's a great way to yeah. put it. That's a very good way to put it. I don't. I the closest thing I've referenced Genesis one through eleven to at least the analogy in my mind that's the most vivid is the uh, preface, the the voiceover at the beginning of the first Lord of the Rings movie, where they oh, had to. Uh, if they if you if you read anybody that's read Tolkien, he has a massive backstory of this world that he created mm. and there's ages and rise and fall of empires. And there, I mean, whole mythologies, but the movie, and, and he has an, uh, hundreds of pages of appendices in the back of the book that tease all that out. Wow. But the movie writers, they had a problem. You've got a three hour movie, which is already pushing the limits of yeah, what you've only got three hours. <laughs> so how do you, fit a an epic into that and what they they made a decision that was brilliant they had the first 10 probably i don't know if it's 10 minutes it might be like five to ten minutes that is just kate blanchett's character giving a voiceover and it just starts when the dark lord saw i made the rings he gave mm. this to men this to elves this, this, this. and it shows all of these Mont I mean, she's telling a very condensed version of thousands and thousands of years of Middle Earth history, and it's showing battles, it's showing epics, it's showing ages, it's it's showing monsters and goodness. It's showing all this stuff, and you're just like, what is that? What is that? Oh my gosh, you're getting glimpses, but the whole point is tracing this ring all the way through until it ends up in the hands of this little hobbit. And then it cuts to the opening scene, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, and then you're in the Shire with, you know, Bilbo and, and Gandalf. I think I have and that. seen that sequence. It's, yeah. I, what I, it I, does I brilliantly about. is it condenses, it doesn't even condense, it just gives a flyover to get you to where the story begins. Yeah. And I've always felt like Genesis 1 through 11 is similar, doing something similar in that yeah. it's, give, it's getting you to where the story begins with Abraham, the call of Abraham. But he's not just some random guy named Avram. He has a lineage that right. goes back to a promise, that goes back to a covenant, that did it all the way back to creation. But that's not the focus. The author's yeah. not trying to tell and us who you, Cain's wife was. I mean, look, at the end of the day, and I love Genesis like deeply. Like, but if you're spending chapters telling us about a man who prostitutes his daughter or his wife, uh, the, these men who are tossing, I mean, there's all kinds of stories which are if I were gonna edit and cut and beef up. I would be like, hey, let's quadruple the creation account and let's uh, let's take out a few of these unsavory moments, you know, these right. girls roofing their dad to have sex with them, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, the the sheer scale to me, even if I were an ancient Hebrew, I think I would pick pick up the drift that 
hey, you need to know where God figures in, in the creation of the universe. And okay, we're we're all like hyping up Genesis 1 through 11. I do want to, for like I do every once in a while, not always, but have my students read other creation, like like, like the Memphite creation account, mm-hmm. uh, the Enuma Elish, of course, um, even some Greco-Roman stuff. What you, but, but I have them read it for this one purpose only because A, they'll see all of this supposed parallels aren't quite as obviously parallel as some people think. Right. Uh, Utnapish team, the, the, the Mesopotamian Noah aside. Um, but also, like when you read Enuma Elish uh, or the Memphite creation, uh, it's rough going. It's just, it's not obvious what's going on. It's written in poetry, but it's not even clear, like, what that poetic mind is doing. Hmm. And then you open up Genesis and it's a very clear flow. It's got, you know, beginning, middle and end. It's got this kind of historical feel to it, even though it's clearly not history in any kind of traditional prose sense of narrative. Um, so like it, it really is as a piece of literature uh, unique. I, like I, it, I think I've come to appreciate that more over the last 10 years than I had before. So hmm. Anyways, okay. Well, no, it's a beautiful thought to, to well, there's a couple of things. It's a beautiful way, thing that Genesis does in balancing cosmic concerns with mm-hmm. familial focus. Right. So the focus is on family, seed, kinship, uh, even land. Right. They're, the everyday stuff that ancient Israelites were concerned about. They were not yeah. concerned. They didn't have the leisure time to be concerned with as much of the metaphysical questions that we because of food supply and modern convenience, we have time to ponder a lot of things mm-hmm. that most of them didn't. But it doesn't mean they didn't care about it or didn't acknowledge it. They just it Genesis Gen, I think Genesis puts it in in the place that makes sense for the audience that Genesis mm-hmm. was originally written for. But yeah. because it's inspired, I think it's inspired scripture, God did so in a way that it would have resonances for everybody in every age. Yeah. If we're just, willing to it scales out well, yeah, yeah. What um, did you call? What did you call that? Uh, uh, scalable comprehensibility. I'm going to remember scalable comprehensibility. Unnes- it's a lot of unnecessary syllables. Did you coin uh, that? Because when I quote I guess it, I'm so. Just now, you. I just came. I just came up with it. So well, I'm going to start quoting you on it because I, I love that. I've I think never used amazing. that phrase before, but I, I I talk about it all the time. The fact that it doesn't matter, and I, old people at my church, you know, like high school diploma people, would just say like. Doesn't matter how many times I read scripture. I always like the more I learn, the more I see, the the deeper the well uh, is, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. So I think it's something that all all people who have spent time in scripture, um, like just you just realize. And I read, uh, you know, I read every semester over and over again with my students. And I, right. I, it's one of the great things about teaching over every semester is I always look forward. I'm always going to learn something from the student. They're going to see something I've never noticed before, or mm-hmm. they're going to ask a question that causes me to tug on a thread and chase it into the night mm-hmm. <laughs> too late into the night. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it is, I say this as somebody who's spent some time in other ancient Near Eastern literature, and I'm in a work group of ancient Near Eastern scholars and like, so we, I, I have a little bit of comparative literary background, just a little bit mm-hmm. that, I don't think it's an overstatement or an apologetic statement or in any way kind of a religionist statement to say the Hebrew biblical literature is uniquely good. So. Mm. Yeah. Well, yes, I don't think, I mean, anybody that would have a problem with that, I think would be showing their bias right. uh, against it because yeah. in, in every measurable metric, I would totally agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times like, I oh, think you, you haven't read enough in, in the ancient world. <laughs> like that's what you I should just go read some other ancient literature. You and then we can have this discussion. Yeah. Yes, I was going to say that if you if most m- most people don't pick up uh, context of scripture or Annette yeah. or some of these volumes, yeah. and they don't actually read it, they just look at memes and they hear somebody who's trying to play up all of the parallels and downplay mm-hmm. the massive differences in order to say it's basically all just the same and it's all right. you know we could just dismiss it all. Christians have another tendency, though, and you talk about this on page seven, uh, when it comes to reading the Bible and and its laconic nature, as Alter says, and you say, let me find that you say uh, dozens of sermons, church dramas and children's services create new fictions every week of that first couple, meaning uh, Adam and Eve or the man and the woman. 
They are depicted as arguing over fruit or wandering conversationally in a perfect tropical garden, perfect by the standards of whatever community depicts it. But the creation stories in Genesis depict a famously laconic creation. It's too short by any standard. Our unacceptably short biblical stories about creation bear such scant details that we often find ourselves telling stories about creation that are not in the biblical creation stories. Just to give viewers who are kind of wading into this whole area for the first time, what are some examples of things that people, fictions that Christians read into mm. the text of creation that aren't actually there? Well, I, I mean, one obvious one that comes to mind is, you know, if you just ask somebody um, what went wrong in Eden, like what what was the thing where if you could stop them, if you could jump in the scene and say, cut, <laughs> don't go down there, uh, you know, what what's the problem in Eden? Uh, and people will say all kinds of things. I mean, I, I play this game with my class, like I'm going to read Genesis 3 line by line. You just stop me when they when they sin. And I quit doing it because uh, students would stop me at every single sentence. And, you know, <laughs> up until even up until like it wasn't sin until they ran and hid because that's, you know, guilty people hide. Right. You know, that's right. uh, so. Um, and then I and so we play that game and then I say, great. What does God say was the problem? Right. Like at what point does he actually come out and say, this is what you did wrong, right? And it's not until he indicts the man. It's actually the only place that it, uh, you have an indictment is of the man because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate of the fruit of the tree I commanded you in the masculine singular, right? So it's referring back to when he com commanded him before the woman was created. So I think that, you know, if you ask people, they have their kind of own caricature of what the problem was. Uh, one of the, the most common ones I hear is, they were the couple was seeking autonomy, right? They were trying to be their own people, mm -hmm. um, which is again just a little bit of an inattentiveness to what's going on in the text. If if the indictment is because you submitted, obeyed, or listened to the voice of your wife, who also he was standing there with his wife listening to the serpent, right? So I think it, right. it's like by implication you both were listening to the serpent instead of me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any world in which we would consider seeking autonomy by shifting your allegiance or your submission to a different voice, a different authority. Like as soon as you say, like, we did what the serpent said instead of doing what you said, that's not autonomy. That's like allegiance or submission of a different sort. You're just picking mm -hmm. a different uh, authority. Um I also like to point out to students and parishioners just to scare them a little bit, like, look, if there's a gap in the text that doesn't mean you fill it with another story, right? Uh, so the in the Talmud, you have this question in Genesis 2, like uh, when the man recognizes at last bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and they say, well, how did he know? Like, how did he know she was the one and not the rhino or not the kangaroo or whatever, you know? Um, it's a legitimate question too, because that that story is about him, him discovering for himself who his proper mate is rather than what seems to be the problem, which is he just doesn't have a proper mate. Um, and Rabbi Eleazar says, well, it's obvious he must have had sex with all the animals and then had sex with the woman. And then he could tell by the difference, which <laughs> I don't want to point out to him, but that, that wouldn't necessarily uh, settle all the questions about the, the proper mate. I mean, we, pre we presume that it would, but not necessarily. And again, that story depending on how you read it, like some of the language in the Hebrew, there is a little bit, it could be read as sexually loaded. So he's not probably as pervy as that, uh, you know, initially right, sounds, right, right. but it's, for me, it's a good instructive example of like, Hey, you can always fill a gap with another, a little bit of story. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, but how do you know you're not doing that? Like what's your check and what your balance or, you know, when you ask people, well, who is the serpent? Well, he's Satan. Okay. Who is Satan? Well, he was one of God's most beautiful angels who uh, led a rebellion and took a third of the angels down with them. And I'm like, great, show me in scripture where that story happens, right? <laughs> right. Um, we have to and and I'm not saying, I mean, yeah, exactly. And so, and I think the story is asking you to imagine God creates the world and somebody with nefarious intent does walk into the scene. So like it, it, in some ways it is raising the question, what, what creates this creature who is wiser than all the other uh, animals who is bent on going against Yahweh Elohim there. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I don't, I think it raises that question. I don't necessarily think it's asking you to create his backstory and be like, oh, he's a jaded iron worker. You know, his <laughs> mama never loved him and his daddy never was around or, you know, like right. do the Batman thing. Uh, uh, the, so like, uh, I, I just think some stories are actually asking you to go ahead and fill in the implications and then some just leave it open. And I think we have to be really careful about what we spackle these stories smooth with. That's a great insight that I give a hearty amen to because it's, it can be, sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's interesting. So I've, I have gotten, uh, especially as I've spent more time with, um, a, a good Jewish friend of mine who is heavily into rabbinics, I've yeah. gotten more, uh, I've, I've kind of dropped some of the caricatures that I had of the rabbis Right. Just kind of making things up. Like usually yeah. they would, like you said, they they're pulling from something now. Yeah, is they it got plausible? Yeah. Is it likely? A yeah. lot of times I don't think it is, but it's it's not being made up whole cloth. And the same yeah. with the church fathers. The early church fathers were notorious for allegorizing and reading in all kinds of things that just weren't there. But apocalypse or uh, pseudepigraphical literature had been doing that right. for centuries because we all want to know the details that the author doesn't give us. And so and to me, that's like something. what flavor was the Tic Tac she stole? You know, <laughs> like, I'm trying to tell you a story. I'm trying to gossip here about Jan, right? <laughs> Quit asking me questions about what flavor they were, right? Uh, I think there has to be that wall at some point that that guides us and says like, okay, we strayed, mm. we strayed away from that. And so I, th yeah, I think for me now, when I, when I think of biblical literature where it gets really stratified and Genesis one is a very stratified text. There's a lot of everything in Genesis one is repeated at some point within mm -hmm. Genesis one. So there's all a lot of repetition. Same thing with the Akedah in Genesis 22. Like you move from this more fluid dynamic storytelling into this like really repetitive, stratified hierarchical mm -hmm. storytelling. Like that to me is saying like, focus, stay focused with me here. I'm trying to like, you're going to get distracted, but I'm trying to tell you this one particular thing or five mm. particular things you need to put in your backpack so you can travel the rest of the journey. Mm. Um, and that's hard so, to notice on your own, especially if you're not someone who's uh, in biblical studies for a living or right. has a degree in it because it is, there's a degree of alien, uh, of foreignness to the text geographically, culturally, linguistically, mm -hmm. And so we need guides. We need people to help. It's like a tour guide at any good right. uh, park right. or exhibit. They will they won't explain what you're seeing in detail. They'll just say, hey, make sure you notice this. Because right. the, the artist wanted to, you know, and they'll just point little things out. And then they let you have the aha moments of putting it all together. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's the beauty of the intellectual world of scripture is that I, I argue in another book that it's a philosophical style, but that style depends not on you following some kind of spoon fed logic that brings you to a deduction, but actually requires you to do quite a bit of work to become discerning about like, Oh, okay. I see the patterns that are emerging from this, you know, constellations will eventually emerge from the starry night of scripture, mm. but you do have to read quite a bit and you have to read over and over big chunks. You know, like I'm a real big fan of not maybe daily <laughs> daily but like including big chunk like if you take a saturday and read genesis three or four times you're just going to see stuff that you would never have noticed before so mm -hmm. that's good okay, advice. We, we did a lot of uh, hermeneutics here that, that's the best that's the best because it's giving people the tools you know that's what our respective dojos try to do <laughs> we don't have the rivalry that cobra kai and miyagi did oh yeah that's right that's right friendly so <laughs> Except for that, you're an actual martial arts black belt, and, and <laughs> well, none of us are. <laughs> you're an actual biblical scholar, so uh, there you go. <laughs> it's only on a business card. Yeah, <laughs> I want to pull one more quote, and I wanted to have you just riff on it a little bit and kind of tease it out for us. You say, actually, there's two. There's a two I want to ask you about. One on page ten about Genesis, and then what the last one I'll ask you is a bigger one. But it says. Genesis disrupts the cultural flow of generational thinking by passing the covenants through the second born instead of the first. This indicates that generational thinking is not merely about producing many lineages, but unexpected lineages. And sometimes mm -hmm. he's generated from the weaker sons, in parentheses, some who turned out to be scoundrels, Jacob over Esau, 
From Genesis's usurping of firstborn son expectation to Paul's rhetoric about God choosing the weak and foolish things, biblical authors delight to disrupt our thinking about convention and strength. Hmm. Tease that out a little bit more, what you're <laughs> That's saying. That's really good. <laughs> and you I can you know the guy who wrote this? He's well, great. <laughs> I, I think at the bottom of that, there probably should be a footnote uh, to that. I don't know if there is or not, but... Um, I, kn- I know who forced me to think through that issue was John Boyd, my editor, because um, he read the whole thing and he's like, hey, have you and maybe I had a comment in there and he said, beef it up or a little bit or something like that. That's what came mm-hmm. out. But it was definitely not my own. Like it was that prodding that I, I came up with that. Uh, this is like everything with me is, is is just an old beef I have with the system. <laughs> um I, you know, I really wear down when people try to talk about the radical New Testament ethic of the upside down kingdom and all this yeah. stuff. And I'm just like, it is there from the very beginning, and including like even the model of kingship that can have no, no military might, no political arrangements, right? No, mm-hmm. um, nothing, none of the conventional weapons uh, that kings have to secure themselves. Um, and so I think what's interesting to me is that metaphysical you know like the world used to be one way and it could have gone you know could the world could have been rightly oriented so that everything kind of grows to our pleasure right uh, if i can put it that way whatever that looks like it's really i think hard for us to imagine it's hard for me to imagine what that would have looked like if everything just went fine you <laughs> know like no messing up uh, um but what's interesting about genesis is is it just keeps taking the same the same power levers, the same ways of executing things that everybody wouldn't have been familiar with. I mean, a lot of people have written, including Jacques Ellul kind of famously, that um, that Babel is really an attack on empire, the idea of empire, that you have an over, you know, this power that spreads out, takes over, crushes, you know, grinds up. And of course, Israel becomes that kind of nation and gets uh, punished horribly for it by God. Um, so... So the fact that it's seeding into the story, like you don't, you don't even get to have a baby in, unless I open up a womb, right? Mm-hmm. Like so, Genesis is really interesting because fertility, uh, you get scarcity of resources, and then once you get to the patriarchs, there's no longer any food scarcity. They actually are food rich, but for like they can't have babies. They're, um, they what do you call it? Birth, birth scarce, mm-hmm. and the only time they can have children is when God opens the wombs, and then. And then God, you know, basically takes the the birth order, the natural rights, and says, ah, not so fast. So, which means that birth order thinking, in some ways, is part of the political realm. I mean, I don't think that's a super controversial in a, in a world right. of kings where dynasties um, are related. But here, it's like the family business. It means the politics of the day are not going to run. So when you get to, you know. Paul kind of like deconstructing political structures of his day or Jesus, you know, first shall be last, you know, powers and principalities language of Paul. Uh, I made perfect, uh, God's powers made perfect uh, in my weakness. Like none of this should be surprising to anybody. This is always the way it was supposed to be. Um, so that's a strong through line. I probably don't trace it. Maybe I do. I don't, I haven't actually read the book you know how when you write a book, you have to actually read it like seven times. Um, of course, yeah. For errors, if, and not including all the rereading of editing and rereading, reading. Um, it gets jumbled together so, for sure. Yeah, so by the time I get, get to the last reading where you turn it in, like you just don't even want to see the thing anymore, you know? Um, so I actually have not looked at it in a long, maybe a year or more. Um, so I'm pulling, I'm pulling. So that's why I was so impressed with those sentences. I was like, Man, I must have just hit some moment of clarity when I right? wrote those sentences because those actually sound good to me. <laughs> I've had that where people repeated something I said in an episode or something, and none, nothing I ever say is scripted. So I'm like, oh, dang, I don't even remember saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, how did I come up with that on the fly? <laughs> well, yeah. it's a good point because it is so prominent in Genesis and, and all the way through Scripture, of course, is, is God. And, and usually it gets preached as, you know, so look what God could even do with a loser like you. Right. Uh, which I don't think is wrong. (laughs) I think that can be encouraging and needs to be preached. I am living proof of that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's a, it's comforting for sure, but it's fat. It's a fascinating upturning of expectations. And this is how, like we tend to think, well, if I was God, and this is a critique that a lot of anti-theists will put forth, what kind of God would 
blah, 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 you know, whatever right. it is. And they'll start critiquing Torah and the stories of the prophets and, and just all these things as for their, you know, how barbaric they are or how unenlightened or this and that. Um, Jay Sklar and I were just talking about, he was on last, we were talking about the, 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 uh, the Sota, the story of the woman accused of adultery and the ordeal. Right. And, and it's uh, sure enough in the comment section on YouTube, guy jumping in atheist, just laying into how misogynistic and barbaric and blah, blah, blah. We, ha it, we have these expectations of like, well, of course, this is how a God should behave. And of course, right. this is how a holy book should read. Right. And, when you open scripture, it just upturns that at almost every turn. Like God is constantly confounding people, their at least their expectations. And it's right. not like you said, it's not a New Testament thing. It's all the way back, all the way back to Genesis. By the way, we do have a uh, Bible Dojo training on the the adulterous woman uh, commands there. Oh, well. so in Numbers five. Yeah, yeah. So we go we go into that one, and um, also you know I, I you have to do it politely. But in those moments when they're like, what kind of a God would do such horrendous evils? And you're like, you realize the reason you think that thing is a horrendous evil is because you've already accepted the Hebraic view of ethics and social norms and power. And like, you've already, like you're swimming and, and breathing their view of the world and, and you're using it to go back and critique it. Uh, so maybe give them a break that maybe they actually know something you don't hear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe they got a wider view that you haven't fully appreciated. But right. you know, I get it. Like I can I can say like I understand um, why you might see this that way. But just remember the only reason you see it your way is because the Hebrew Bible exists. Exactly. And, yeah. and comparatively, you know, uh, Jay talked about he, he read from Hammurabi's code in similar situation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And absolutely. he was like. Oh, yeah. Throw them this, in the river. <laughs> <laughs> this was a this was a, a distinct contribution of the, yeah. the, the the God of Israel and yeah. Scripture. Let me end with this last quote, and because I think this is sort of summarize. It's how you end the chapter on page thirteen, um, and so this will be a good sort of way to wrap things up. But you say, I will suggest that the actual conflict between science and Scripture is not evolution versus creation. Rather, the conflict turns on how one answers this question about the present physical state of the universe. Is it now as it was in the beginning and evermore shall be? So you, you alluded to that at the beginning of this conversation, and I think that's a good way to inclusio the mm -hmm. discussion. But for those who are either completely uninitiated in biblical ethics or, I mean, biblical theology, or, or are not super familiar with Genesis. Right. Um, just how, how would you restate that or, or, or tease that out for somebody who is thinking about picking up and reading this book? Yeah. Um, and by the way, so I began, I did this research on sabbatical. I think me and actually my two other research fellows, we all had the same like, oh, great. We finally get to take a semester and just think about this issue of evolutionary science and theology or scripture. Like we've been putting this off. We've always wanted this time. Now we're going to do it. And I think we all three naively thought like, we're going to figure this out. Like maybe <laughs> even together, we're just going to nail this. And I can say I have definitely come away more agnostic about a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, including like what to do with the fossil record, uh, natural history. I mean, there's also a discussion like a lot of, there's a lot of fragility in evolutionary uh, theorizing mm -hmm. because almost everything you dig out of the ground like changes the theory by a half a million years or something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, wait, how did I get down that road? Let's see. I got to retrace my steps. We're talking about... <laughs> you spin a semester. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, um, I think I'm not trying to solve in this book the problem of how do you fit evolutionary scientific understanding with the Bible. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I'm trying to get people to understand is that the biblical authors do have a view that maybe is commensurable. I don't know. Like I just couldn't work out a way. But they do have a view that like the world existed in a certain estate, an orientation, a metaphysic, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that it's not that way now. And that that actually kind of changes every single thing. That creates the possibility of cancer. That creates the possibility of 
rust. I don't know if I want to include, I feel like dicey. I feel like there's going to be some materials engineer who's going to be, oh, no, 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 we need rust in order to do whatever. It creates the right. possibility of tetanus, which comes from rust. Let's put it that way. <laughs> gotcha. uh, maybe maybe patinas are a good thing, but tetanus is not. Um <laughs> It it creates all of these these possibilities, and by that orientation, the the example I've always heard is that uh, cancer is is just a good human body cell. Uh, you know, cancer cells don't come from the outside; they're just a human body cell that is turned against the body and and convinced a bunch of other cells to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and that orientate like so if you want to end cancer you just reorient those cells so they don't turn against the body right mm -hmm. I, I say that as if that's easy and someone should have done that by now but okay. like that that is the solution to the problem um from the biblical author's point of view is this kind of grand re, re, right rightly oriented world mm -hmm. um and again I think it's important to know that if you're like me, you've grown up in a world like every, every other human we ever know. We've never seen this fully rightly oriented universe that's being talked about. Mm -hmm. And many of us are basically like Gideon. You know, when the angel comes to Gideon, he says, well, where are all these signs and wonders our ancestors told us about? Like, what, Where is this world that uh, we've heard all of these great things, but we don't see this God fighting on our behalf now? Um, and we don't see the kind of miraculous reorientation of the world now. And I think this is what's so important about when Jesus comes, this is kind of getting into the biblical theology, is that he gives little peaks and glimpses into this reorientation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to me that he didn't give the crippled man like his his walking again and uh, an extra hand he can open beers with while he's talking with both of his other hands, right? <laughs> that he, he restored, and even blind Bartimaeus, um, in, uh, what is it? Mark nine or 10, Mark 10. Uh, he says, what do you want me to do for you? And he doesn't say, make me, give me riches or make me the fastest person or let me fly. Mm -hmm. He says, I want to recover myself. I want to go back to the way that I was supposed to be. And so again, it's that whatever happens there, I think the metaphysic that they're, they seem to have in their, their mind's view is that reorientation that, I don't think most of us, well, I don't, most people I know, most Christians don't walk around with that view. Their view of the solution, okay, I'm going to throw a little shade here. Their view of the solution, which I don't actually think is necessarily biblical, and maybe it can, it can fit with scripture. I don't think it comes from scripture, is that the way you solve the problem is your body goes in the ground, your soul goes into heaven. Right. And the end, right? Um, and I don't, Actually, I'm not even sure if Scripture teaches that at all. Um, maybe it does, but you'd have to really convince me, and I've thought about it for a little bit. That, that's not a hot take. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure if Scripture teaches that. And, and But what does it teach is teaches over and over again the resurrection of the dead, right? The, the bringing back of the dead and the reorientation of the— it's the renewed heavens, the renewed earth. It's all of that that language. Um and I think normal evolutionary science doesn't have to take account of any of this, right? It's like not on them to take account of the particular Hebrew slash Christian worldview and world, uh, world, world pictures. Right. Um, but for people who want to make theistic evolution kind of commensurate with what's going on in scripture, I think they actually do have to take this stuff to, into account. Mm -hmm. And that's where the conflict was a little deeper than just science versus religion. It's like, okay, now amongst us religious people who believe scripture is guiding, scripture is actually has a little bit more pronounced critique of the idea of evolution just being a panaceic explanation for everything that you see around you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think, and I don't, I, whether you agree, I don't know. Uh, I know many Christians may not agree. I feel like when it comes to theistic evolutionists and, and I have tremendous respect. I, I'm kind of like you. I have lots of friends who are theistic evolutionists lots of and friends I, who are theistic and, and maybe I'm one too. I don't know yet. I'm, I'm just kind of in this liminal state where I don't know what to think about a lot of these things and the jury's out. And for, yeah. For me well, you said, you said you said you, you become more agnostic on some things. And, yeah. and to me, that's more and more where I've been. I used to be, I, I grew up theistic evolution, like, Pretty, oh, okay. I mean, I grew up reading National Geographic and hominids and, and you know, just my uh, my dad, who was one of my most formative influences, he was a pastor and um, he 
was influenced by Bernard Ram back in the 50s mm, and the, wow. to, to incorporate modern scientific findings with a high view of scripture. And so for me, the fundamentalist thing was never an issue. In college, I flirted with young earth creationists. I would give more... I wouldn't just dismiss them immediately. I would start right. reading some other stuff. And then then I would read more from um, intelligent design proponents and, and anti-neo-Darwinian advocates, Philip Johnson and those kind of people. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of have never landed squarely in, in one camp or the other uh, firmly enough to say this is the view that I'm going to propagate. Mm -hmm. But what I see in different views, like like with, with young earth creationism, Genesis literalism, whatever you want to call it, it, the, it's, it, it, is, it becomes God of the gaps. Like God did it. And if the right. text doesn't say how God did it, you just know he did it. And, and so you introduce a miracle. You know, yeah, God got penguins to the Middle East to get them on this ark supernaturally. Uh, God had trees grow after the world had been flooded catastrophically within less than a year supernaturally. You know, everything just becomes this right. miracle. But I see a tendency amongst even certain theistic evolutionists to do the same thing with uh, appealing to just, well, evolution did this. Well, how do you know? Because right. that's what we see around right. us today. So evolution must have done it. And that's always unsettled me. And they do not like when I point that out because it seems a little too much like the fundamentalist God of the gaps it just becomes evolution of the gaps. And yeah. I don't know where I land on that. I'm, I'm interested to in reading your book when it comes out to see how you interact with that, because I resonate kind of with the agnostic part when it comes to that. Yeah. And what I tried to do is really just kind of dis be descriptive with what a, the biblical authors, were, biblical authors were doing, which I tried to make that as fun as possible. But at the end of the day, you just have to walk through a lot of scripture and think about what it's saying. Mm -hmm. But also to be very descriptive with uh, what Darwin is saying and what evolutionary scientists are critiquing Darwin about. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it really is. Fa I mean, Darwin is a really smart guy who is really thinking very honestly. Mm -hmm. um, he's not, you know, he doesn't have an agenda. I can't tell if he has an agenda. He really just seems to be like a guy really trying to work it out. And I read a lot of the letter, his correspondences mm -hmm. uh, with people as well. And although he did always shrug away from people who wanted to connect what he's saying to scripture, because there were people even in his day that were like, hey, you know, uh, Genesis can fit what you're saying in there. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, ah, I'm just not interested. And, you know, he trained to be a, a, a clergyman at Cambridge. So He'd, he'd at least read a, a lot of scripture at some point in his life. Um, so I'm just trying to faithfully represent what I think they're saying on the whole. I did have uh, one, one, yeah, one working scientist, a really good guy, went through and scrubbed the manuscript and told me to quit saying certain things because I'm just going to piss off scientists. <laughs> right. He helped me Help correct me. my language and he helped me correct a few concepts. Um, and so that was really, really good because I really did. I didn't. I didn't need to nail the science. I just wanted to make sure that I was nailing. Like, here's basically what they think about these things. Right. Um, and uh, even then, uh, everywhere I turned, I didn't see any any surmountable ways of reconciling everything. And I and I'm I, I mean that in every direction, whether that's scripture or the data, or I just watched a three hour documentary on Homo Naledi. And, you know, possible graves there, you know, that go back um, pretty far, like uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And you're like, dang, I don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so and maybe and maybe that's my encouragement is that it's OK to be in that liminal space and not make these decisions. And maybe it's a little hubristic to think that me, a person who is only has an undergraduate education in science, is going to somehow figure all this out and then tell everybody now, here's what you should believe. So. I'm okay. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the way to have a bestseller is to do the opposite of that is to tell everybody, oh, yeah. Hey, I've figured it out. And yeah. here's a foolproof way to, you know, for you to do the same 12 steps why you can be great and everybody can be wrong. Right. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's what internet culture of the day has taught me. Yeah. So you can take that. So I think it's worth, I, I am anticipating the emails that say I got to the end of your book and I, and you never actually said what you think is, the right answer, uh, which I can just tell you right now is true. I do not. <laughs> I do end with a, I don't know how to reconcile these two things. Here's where the, the hard conflicts exist for me. So, yeah, that's good. That's an honest, that's an honest wrestling with it. And that lets people, and people should know that going in that you're not mm -hmm. looking to solve the problem or clear, you know, this is not going to be the end all 
be all of this debate. And anybody who thinks they could produce that is somebody who you don't need to read. Yeah, <laughs> I would say. I will, I will give them some saucy new things to think about with the new heavens, new earth. And and I, I dare say that probably some of the biblical theology is going to be a very new way of looking at old old things. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think there That's are things great. worth thinking about from Scripture here. That's um, great. Well, I, I love... New, uh, the, as as I am uh, card carrying lifelong evangelical uh, within the Wesleyan tradition, however you want to categorize me, you're Wesleyan. But, yeah, yeah. I oh, grew up man. born and raised United Methodist. Just until recently, <laughs> 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 I'm one of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, as someone from just a evangelical perspective, um, I pride my teaching ministry and the ministry of disciple dojo on not teaching anything new, mm -hmm. but teaching old in new ways. Yeah. You yeah, know? And, exactly. and so the, you saying that is like, that's what we have to do every generation. So I, I, I think this is great that you're doing it. Uh, I wish I could say more about the book. I've only read the first chapter, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's got a whole chapter on sex and <laughs> sold. That's how you actually, do Play that up uh, in your marketing. There is a saucy uh, interpretation of Babel where I argue that this is not about the whole earth. This is actually about Ham's descendants. Uh, Interesting. And, uh, and it makes a difference uh -huh. in, for other other passages. Like it, it, it's, it, it's significant that you realize that this is not about the whole earth. Mm. A, oh, I like it. Uh, I like uh, I don't know exactly where you're going with that. And that's why yeah, I like it. I I'll tease you with that one. <laughs> Great. That's what we want. When people approach, when when your typical Christian, you know, committed Christian, been going to church, fired up about Jesus, they want to start learning about science. A lot of times they wander into a Christian bookstore or the Christian mm. YouTube blogosphere, and it's just, you're going to get fed a lot of junk. Uh, it's right. just junk it's not food. safe. And it's not a gonna, safe space. Right. You're going to be sent down a very unproductive uh, rabbit hole. And and the right. bad thing is you'll think you're learning a lot about science right. and faith, and you're actually not. Uh, you're mislearning, and then then it has to get corrected later. So I so Templeton is an example. Templeton, um, Biologos, you know, people that are affiliated with them, they're doing substantial work. Doesn't mean I agree with them all the time. Right. Uh, I, reasons to believe Hugh Ross's organization. Yeah. I don't yeah. agree with Hugh Ross all the time, biblically, but I love what they're doing and how they're doing it, getting people into it. So there are different, the landscape is varied out there. Uh, and then you, you do have the other answers in Genesis stuff that I just, I just don't, I never send people that way. Uh, Al for although life. answers in Genesis Canada is, have you seen them? No, I have not. Is it? But they are taking a, somewhat different approach i've been watching their youtube channel and mm -hmm. mildly impressed with the way they present what they're thinking it's okay. not no no offense ken ham but it's not your old style ken ham it's actually doing something new so anyways i, I don't mind offense to I, ken ham uh I, because I like, he's naturally offensive to everyone who yeah. doesn't agree with him but <laughs> that's good to hear that they're not yeah. that they're okay. they're doing interesting things i mean it you know it's like i I'm one of those, like, I want to hear it all. I want to hear yes, all the perspectives. Yes, yes. And, all, and they every once in a while, they crank out something where I'm like, hmm, that's really interesting. I had not thought about that before. So That's good to know for me then, because I would be predisposed to not paying attention uh, as yeah. much just because of my own experiences with uh, the American Answers in Genesis. Uh, but <laughs> We've all uh, had that experience. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's a good, I'm glad you interjected that. That actually, I learned something from that, and that helps me. Uh, what would you, so I recommend people there in, in our, um, I'll, I'll link it in the description, our course here at Disciple Dojo, it was recorded over 10 years ago. So the AV quality oh, is wow. not great, okay. but it's free. Uh, but Bible and science, friends or foes, there's a downloadable workbook that we have with a, mm. a, a bibliography recommended reading in different areas, different Christian views. What are some, if you had to give somebody coming up to you saying, I'm really fascinated in the intersection of science and faith, like a new student, mm -hmm. a, a science major who just became a Christian, uh, what would you, where, where would be some things you'd point them towards? Either names of authors or specific works, uh, older books, yeah. newer works. What, what advice would you give? Um, I think I would be tempted to send them into uh, John Polkinghorne's uh, Trinity and 
science. I, it's something like that. John Pokinghorn's book. I know what it looks like on the cover, but I can never pull that. It's like your kids' names. You just can't ever remember. <laughs> it's their, like your own books. They're holding. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but that one is is he's a working, you know, former scientist uh, and and turned theologian. Which there's a few of those actually out there. David Wilkerson is another one, kind of with the cosmological side. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's good, as you know, there's good stuff on BioLogos. Uh, Josh Swamidas has kind of like a, <laughs> I don't know if it's a counter narrative to BioLogos, but he's also a, he's a computational biologist. He's a, he's a, he's a very sharp guy. Um, but he, uh, is definitely, he thinks some of the biologo stuff is not on point. Uh, and so he has his own, like, Hey, I'm a working scientist. Here's what we actually think over in the genetics and computational sciences. Uh, his perspective, he's got an interesting book on the genealogical Adam and Eve, uh, which basically says the, you didn't have to have a bottleneck of 10,000 or 1000, but you could actually have two human beings. Hmm. Plus, two specially created human beings plus evolution and can explain all the genetic diversity of human beings by one AD. Hmm. Um, so, and he, and he's, he's saying that because he's run the numbers as a computational biologist and, mm-hmm. and he's gone back and corrected all of these other people um, in the Christian theistic evolutionary world who said, no, no, no you never get below 12,000 or 1000. So he's, right. he's done that work. Um, Ian Barber's book, I think is always interesting. Um, Another one, Ian Barber's book on science, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's something like the philosophy foundations of science. I, I, I'm not done with this book, but this is a good one. Magisteria by Nicholas Spencer, mm-hmm. where he just kind of shows how science has always been religious. It's always been embedded with religion and religion is what religious uh, or theology is what basically has always pushed science forward. I will also point out that by that, he also means that essentially um, science continues to drop off Greek f- philosophical ideas. And, and the more it drops off Greek philosophical ideas, the better science and engineering gets, hmm. which has been my thesis for a long time. So I was very happy to see a historian of science uh, lay that out. Even like, again, I don't agree with all of it, but like uh, Nancy Piercy's The Soul of Science has some really interesting points about quantum mechanics. And like, if you don't understand quantum mechanics, there's a chapter in that it actually explains quantum mechanics better than any other simple explanation I've ever read. <laughs> so, so Let's I always like that kind of stuff, but yeah, yeah. I, I, and again, I, I think everybody should critically engage these sources. Yeah. Uh, Do you interact at all or have you interacted when you were getting prepping for this book with, uh, with William Lane Craig's Adam work that he's done recently? I did. He actually came out with that. I, I saw, I was at a conference where he presented that went to a workshop of us, a small group. And um, yeah, it's an interesting, I think what he's trying to do is give a philosophical basis for Josh Swamidas's uh, computational biology work. Mm, okay. um, so I, I think, I think they most, it was actually those two have been a discussion about William Lane Craig's book. And, um, mm-hmm. and I think, think they basically agree he's very sympathetic to josh's work and he's just trying to figure out what a theological human looks like because that's a category you know like if you have evolution and special creation like what when does a human become a theological creature or not so Mm -hmm. um, i do not interact with it though i haven't gotten a chance to read it i've had people ask what i think about it and i've just I just say, like, I, I like well, Wayne Craig. It, you know, yeah. generally, I think he's thoughtful, even when I may not agree theologically. Yeah. But I, I think it's probably not going to be sloppy or shoddy. Uh, <laughs> there is, there is zero chances of anything he writes being sloppy. Uh, now, the chances of me agreeing with all of it are also right. uh, it's above zero. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, no, he is not a sloppy thinker at all. Yeah. Well, there's the, with with science and faith and that intersection because there are viable. I think biblically there are viable views that you can take, right? Multiple options, and I right, don't know right. which one I end yeah. up with. And even even again, even I don't lean towards young earth creationism, but there are some good arguments, and there are thoughtful young earth creationist theologians out there. I'm not trying to dismiss or poo-poo them all as Ken Ham's, but um, so, so I always try to get across to viewers. And that's what I want viewers watching this video to get across is you can land where you land. Just don't land there out of uh, ignorance or dishonesty towards other views or caricatures. Uh, You know, 
enter into the discussion, grab, grab or if your hermeneutic you is the Bible just says, so therefore, exactly. Like, just, nothing good is going to come after the, therefore, when that's yeah. your, uh, yeah. your mode could, of thinking. Could not agree more. And I say that yeah. again, as a car carrying evangelical all my life, high view of the yeah. uh, inspiration yeah. of scripture. That's just a bad, bad way to approach it. And I'm going to get comments on this YouTube video telling me to the contrary, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that should be a whole, yeah, you're, you're working on that issue. But yeah, I, I think scripture is actively telling you not to. Here's my cell on this. If you're a Christian, like traditional Christian, I'm I'm evangelical Presbyterian minister, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, this is a total tangent, but it's an it. important Love one. It. Love tangents. We, then you, unless you want to take a systemic error or a heretical position, we actually believe that there are, there's not one account of Jesus' life, but we believe there are four independent accounts from four different perspectives that are not mutually inclusive. They cannot be reconciled to one another. Tatian tried to do that um, with the Dia Tesseron uh, in the second century. And and I think he gave up or realized that it wasn't going to work, right? So um, we believe in that kind of multi-perspective. And here's the important part is that uh, I think it, throughout Christian history, we've always believed that those four gospels together are more true than any one of them. They give a more accurate picture of who Jesus is and what he was about and, and how we are to respond to God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, and so anytime you read anything and just say, well, that's just what, you know, I read the gospel of Luke and that's just, you know, it's what it says and it's plain and it's obvious. Like, well, no, you actually have to check with what Matthew had to say about that as well and what Mark and maybe even John, if it shows up in there as well, which is very little. And so this kind of just says, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't pass the basic sniff test of the Gospels, much less, you know, Chronicles versus Kings and Samuels, mm -hmm. uh, much less Deuteronomy's retelling of Exodus and Numbers, right? Like, uh, it just no, it's it's just not how the text presents itself. Um, right. So, so I think it's that's I think that works as long as you stay in very cherry picked sections of of Scripture. And never step outside of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you you end up you end up having to proof text, yeah. Uh, which proof text? <laughs> which people the, are like, what's so wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good yeah. enough for the Westminster divines. What? <laughs> I, I, proof texting Sorry. is the bane of good theology. Yes. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll do an episode sometime on proof texting, <laughs> but. In, <laughs> We you can uh, get me to dog on anything you can tell now. So that's what. See, I just want. I'm. I'm just getting you in, and you take the heat. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll just have you crazy Drew, <laughs> and then the board of trustees at Hope College can figure yeah, out. Yeah, they're what like, what did we just hire? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm glad to see the book is coming well, out. Thank you very much for that. Um, am I going to see you at SBL? Absolutely. All it's right. The most wonderful time of the year. Forget of about that baby Jesus stuff. <laughs> the the fifty percent off book sale. That's what we exactly got, you know. exactly. I'm looking forward to getting back, um, and I will will catch up out there. Um, it'll be cool to know a few more people this year because you know. Oh yeah. All I met last year. I saw you at a reception last year, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so we'll 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 mingle some more and turn our noses up at uh, the all the plebs <laughs> out there. But no, thanks for for coming in, and and I'm really excited to for people to see the book and to see your work, and I'm hoping that this will be not just your book, but <clears throat> this whole discussion of scripture and science and how the two just. What do you do with both of them? Mm. I'm hoping that that'll be a springboard for a lot of people to go further in their studies. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So check out Drew's work is the new book coming out. I'll, I'll link to the first chapter. You can read for the first chapter for free online. I'll link to that. And I'll also uh, link to Bible Dojo again, viewers get on board with Bible Dojo. What they're doing is really cool. I love the vision of it. And I disciple Dojo is fully on board with it. Um, so and yeah, us man, as well with you. Well, I appreciate it. And let's continue yeah. to think how we can, uh, help, help, uh, what is it? Rising tide raises all the ships. Raises so, all boats. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, thanks for stopping by my friend. Have a great afternoon and I'll see you at SBL. All right. My pleasure. My honor to be on here twice. Yes. Blue belt. Love it. <laughs> all right. Take care, brother.
I hope you enjoyed that discussion. Again, I want to thank Drew for coming on, spending an afternoon talking to us. I would love to hear your comments on anything that we've talked about in this video. I'm sure that there's stuff that either Drew or I or both of us said that people will heartily agree with and heartily disagree with. And that's okay. That's part of what, whether it's Bible Dojo or whether it's Disciple Dojo, that's what you do in a dojo. You spar and it's okay. It makes everybody better. So feel free to leave your comments in the comment section below. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching. And as always, keep training.